We've never had this kind of a challenge to religious liberty. We are at a critical point in America. The result is causing rights to religious freedom to erode very quickly. When the founders envisioned this new nation, they wanted to create a land that was free for Christianity to flourish. We live in a country that is the light of freedom to the world. It's critical that the next generation understands that. I'm not so confident in Washington, but I am confident in the American people. You either get on board with their orthodoxy or you give up. They want the least diversity of any people in our culture. There's no room for God. The church really needs to wake up. We aren't exercising the power that we have to do good. There's a window of opportunity where we can fight. We're entering a very dangerous period. We just need to wake up. It's one of those things that's sort of not reversible if you get it wrong. As American citizens, we have a remarkable privilege to live in this country that has such religious freedom, um, perhaps such that has never been experienced in human history. That is a wonderful gift to us. And because of that, we need to be good stewards of this time in history where we have the erosion of religious liberty happening in our lifetimes. We need to guard it, be able to explain what freedom of religion is, and be able to say what are the consequences of further erosion of religious liberty. It is critically important that we do this on some of the most challenging issues of our day. Mount Soledad has always been a focal point for the city of San Diego. And for native San Diegans such as myself, it's very much a, a beloved landmark. It's a beautiful setting. It's uh, the highest point in San Diego. It overlooks the ocean on both sides. It's right near both a naval base and an Air Force base. It's probably one of the most beautiful memorials we have in this country. San Diego has always had an identification with the military. We have over 240,000 veterans living in San Diego County, more than any other county in America. Well, at the top of the hill is a uh, very distinctive veterans memorial, and in the centerpiece of the memorial is a cross. But the memorial itself is unique in that we have over 3,300 plaques of individual veterans who have served honorably. We do have a lot of celebrities who are there. Uh, we have Medal of Honor recipients, but we have just plain people who have served their country, and that's who we like to concentrate on, you know, those who have served their country honorably. It's been there for a long time until it was attacked uh, by the ACLU, saying you can't have this memorial up here, it's federal land. Well, this particular battle is probably the longest running religious liberty fight of its kind in the history of the United States. And they sued both the uh, federal government uh, and the veterans who have control over that memorial. To me, when I look at the cross there, I see it as a symbol of the selfless sacrifices that veterans have made in service to their country. I think one of the nuttiest things I ever hear is that somebody's symbol expressed in a free society poses a threat. No, it poses an affirmation of the freedom of that society to accept any number of religious symbols. It's representing uh, sacrifice and people giving the ultimate sacrifice for their country. It, it's outrageous to me that somebody would take offense in a cross that was put there by and for veterans to commemorate their service in the war. And I'm wondering, when is the lawsuit going to happen that will force us to go to Arlington Cemetery and take down every cross in Arlington? What do you do with the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier that says, known but to God? What do you do with the crosses and stars of David and religious symbols that are in every community of every state of this country? It is not the government's job to determine which symbols of faith are appropriate and proper. It's the government's job only to protect that there is a freedom to have religious expression 
And the Constitution expressly forbids Congress from getting involved, making a law that would be an impediment to anybody's expression. I have a Marine that served in my platoon who was killed September 10th, 1967. And every time I go to that memorial, it's good. I stop and say a prayer. This is about our veterans. They should, it's about remembering and respecting and the way this is being handled, it's like they're trying to take a sledgehammer uh, to that concept and to the, you know, to the veterans. I don't know of any veteran that I've talked to who has indicated, yeah, that cross has to come down. They like the memorial as it is, and they want it to stay as it is. It, it is critically important um, for our freedom of speech, for our freedom of association, for all these other freedoms, that we have a robust understanding of what religious liberty is. Liberty is always one generation away from extinction. Um, so you can never be too uh, vigilant in protecting your rights and protecting your liberty. We must engage these ideas. It's, it, it is not possible to be on the sidelines of this debate anymore. It's become clear to me that this is at the heart of American liberty. Um, if you believe in America, if you care about the liberties we've had in America, you need to understand what they are. You need to understand what they are not. And you need to understand that they were bought uh, with, with uh, an expensive cost of blood, of lives, of treasure, um, not just in 1776 and in that war, but, but since then. It's very fragile and it can go away. And it will go away if we do not attend to the threats to religious freedom right now. We have to remember, religious citizens are citizens too and they have the equal rights of every other citizen, right? Just as other citizens can bring their convictions into the public square, religious citizens can and should bring their convictions into the public square. Don't you lose your rights because you're religious. You really can't walk into Hobby Lobby without knowing in a very short period of time what the culture is here. We've tried to develop a culture of uh, really service, to serve one another. When we bring our managers in, we tell them that they're not here to serve us, but we're here to serve them. I think that our statement of purpose probably says that as well as anything, and that is that we want to operate our business according to biblical principles. To my knowledge, there's no big box company that's only open 66 hours a week. We're closed on Sundays, closed at 8 at night. We have a minimum wage for our employees of $14 an hour. We just say to them, we care about you in every way we possibly can. At first it was a bit vague. We just knew that there was new legislation coming down, didn't know exactly how that would affect us. And then when the uh, Supreme Court determined that it was uh, legal, then that's when we had to get serious about what the implications were. We felt like this was a large decision because we could have some pretty dire consequences. Uh, we did have a family meeting and uh, everyone was able to share their thoughts. You know, it was an uh, honest and open discussion uh, with all three generations. This is a private company. We own the company. We built the company. We believe that uh, life begins at conception and they're asking us to take our finances and pay for this abortive pill, and so we just knew that we couldn't do that. I really didn't have any question whatsoever how the family would come down. The family was unified in the fact they said, this is not something that we want to do as a family. Uh, I think there was a sense of peace that uh, this is the right thing to do. Never in our 237 years as a republic 
has any government decree make us fund the taking of innocent human life as a condition of continuing in business. One of the more common comments is that we're imposing our religion. That is a violation of my faith. It is not that we want to impose our religion on anyone. We want to be able to share what our beliefs are, but we're not imposing it on anyone. These are real heroes who uh, could easily say, well, you know, we'd love to fight this, but we'd lose a lot of money. They're saying money is not as important as the morality involved. We care about people, we care about women, we care about life, and that's why we do so much to do all we can for every employee. As I sat in the Supreme Court during the Hobby Lobby argument, the Solicitor General of the United States, I mean the highest lawyer in the country representing our federal government and the president, standing up in front of the court and saying, and this is not an exaggeration, this is what he said, that when you decide to go into business and make a profit, you are making a decision to waive your religious freedoms and that you now operate under the government's rules. It's an extreme thing that the federal government argued in front of all of our justices. In many cases, it's when things get tough, when things get challenging, that uh, people wake up and realize uh, we are in a situation that is dire. And we need to make sure that the freedoms that were granted to us uh, by our founders, that uh, they are upheld. Uh, we're in a situation where we're gonna have to take a stand. When you saw Hobby Lobby, standing up as a Christian organization, that it wasn't gonna move away from biblical principles. No matter what the consequences to them, uh, to the company, they were gonna be faithful. All Christians in this country and all Christian organizations, they're gonna to have to choose where they stand. Do, do they stand with the, I just need to go along with the culture so I won't have to pay any consequences? Or are they gonna be, you know what, I'm gonna stand with Jesus Christ no matter what it costs me. The idea that an individual as devoutly Christian as the Green family can open and operate a business and put their faith at the curb, it can't be done. When the founders envisioned this new nation, they wanted to create a land that was free for Christianity to flourish. Their vision is based upon the idea of natural rights that are inalienable rights. I've always thought we had a lot to learn from understanding their philosophical, theological, and political arguments. Uh, it's not just that they're our founders, they were some of the most thoughtful statesmen in human history. The Founding Fathers weren't at all uh, sort of the, the modern breed. Uh, that says, let's, just, let's let them have their religion as long as they contain it for two hours on Sunday morning. Uh, they understood the power of religion to shape a society, and they welcomed it. They just didn't want it to be manipulated by the federal government. The first permanent English settlement in America was Jamestown in 1607. The first laws written in America were written in Jamestown from 1609 to 1612. 1620, the pilgrims wrote the famous Mayflower Compact, where they covenanted together under God form a civil body politic. There were over a hundred different constitutions, compacts, and charters written during the colonial period from 1607 to 1776. The Declaration is our national covenant. Thirteen years later, we came up with a new form of government that went into effect in 1789. This is the United States Constitution. The original Constitution emerged from the Constitutional Convention at Philadelphia without any provisions that we now call the Bill of Rights. Many of the founders argued we didn't need the Bill of Rights, you know, because nothing empowered the federal government to be establishing a church in the first place. Nonetheless, opponents of the Constitution made an awful fuss about the absence, almost complete absence, of any specific rights protections. Madison rose on the floor of the House of Representatives in New York in June of 1789 and gave his great speech introducing a set of amendments to the Constitution. The first things in the First Amendment are uh, the provisions on religion. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. 
The Establishment Clause simply rules out that there shall be any national church in the way that England has had a Church of England. There, there can't be a Church of the United States. They had a national church in Europe, and that brought some persecution that caused people to flee to America, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Simply what that means is that civil government has no right to get involved in how individuals worship, how they fulfill their duty to their creator. What was considered important about the First Amendment with the Free Exercise Clause is that we had the right to carry what was in our head into the affairs of our daily life, both in private and in the public square. We have a right as individuals to express our religion, to be involved in our religion, and government is not supposed to interfere. This is, this is the first of our rights, the one which, if sacrificed, undercuts the ground of all our other rights because it is founded in a duty we have before any duties as citizens, before any duties to the state, before any duties to obey the law. We have a duty to our Creator. And that's why it comes first. The Founders' understanding was of the free exercise of religion, something that informs man's behavior and man's thoughts Monday through Sunday, every day of the week, including their, uh, the values that they bring into their public life, but also with their business life, their professional life, their commercial life. They understood that there were going to be people who ran their businesses in accordance with the values that they believed God demanded of them. Uh, and that's the free exercise of religion. I've always, since I was a little girl, like loved weddings. I started in 2006 out of my house. I remember when we opened the shop, when I got to like decorate it how I wanted, and I just got to like be artsy, you know, with my place. It was really awesome to discover that I could be a part of weddings. Arlene's has been in business for 47 years. I tell my crew, I don't write their paycheck, the customers do, so. We have prayer every morning. If you want to join us, fine. If you don't, fine. But I let them know up front that we run the store in that perspective. There's so many hurting people out there, and there's, uh, especially on funerals or somebody lost a child, that we want to be responsive and loving and caring. A lot of people have told me that it's their centerpiece of their wedding. I really like to sit down with them and I like to find out more about them. It's all centered around, we custom design your cake for you. It's not pick what's in this book. Um, every one of them is a work of art from Melissa. Sometimes we'll service the weddings. We'll go there, set up the flowers for them. Many times I've walked the pride down the aisle and pinned on the flowers for the guest. Her, her personality is such that yeah, I don't think that there was anybody that came in, ordered a cake, and didn't feel like Melissa was their friend afterward. <laughs> Melissa had set up the appointment. Uh, it was via email, I believe. A gal and her mom came in. They sat down, and just like every other time, I said, OK, what's the wedding date? He asked, um, you know, what's the bride and, and Gruden's name? Because that's always like one of our first questions, because it's not the top of our contract. She kind of giggled, said it's two brides. Um, I was actually very apologetic. I said, I'm really sorry. Um, I think I wasted your time. We don't do cakes for same-sex ceremonies. She looked at her mom. They kind of got a disgusted look on their face, got up and walked out. I asked my husband, I'm like, were you nice? Like, how did it go? And he's like, no, I was very nice. I was very friendly about it. And, but they just, you know, they weren't happy. And I was like, OK. He's like, it'll be OK. And then all of a sudden, I hear him say, I'm going to have to call you back. The, the mom came back in. She said, you got to say your piece, and I'd like to say mine. And I said, OK. She told me that she once believed the way I believe, but since her truth had changed. Rob has been a customer of ours for a long time, and we had a good relationship, and 
we always made special arrangements for him and, and it was a, a fun thing for me, it was a fun thing for him. And he came in the store one day and we were chit-chatting and he says, oh, I'm gonna get married. And uh, I just grabbed his hand and said, I'm sorry, Rob, I can't do your flowers because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, he said, I understand. And he said, uh, it's okay. And uh, we talked for a while and visited and we hugged each other and he left. And so we thought everything was fine between both of us and then the next day it went viral. We got a lot of phone calls and emails of people calling a, me and Aaron um, a hater. Lots of just really mean, mean-spirited phone calls and emails. We'd get people poke their head in the door at the shop, yell profanities and run, you know. It's just, it blows my mind that uh, to simply say, I don't want to take part in this, gets that kind of a backlash. I mean, if Rob walked in my door today, I'd give him a hug and sell him flowers. I'm not a hater. I, I love everybody. And I mean, I even love gay people. I've had gay friends, you know, I'm not, I don't hate them. It's not about that. Melissa worked really hard over the last seven years to build up a referral list. People she referred, they referred her. And now I pretty much don't have really anybody that refers me anymore. Um, I've lost all of them. You know, doing the birthday cakes and the baby shower cakes and all that was fun and great, but it just, it just didn't pay the bills. The wedding cakes, that's what paid the bills. So we made the decision to close the door on September 1st. Aaron found a job, thank God. I remember the last day of like closing the shop and it was when we were leaving and it was the last time we were gonna lock that door. I just broke down. This is her dream. This is her, I'm, she put everything, her heart and soul into it, you know. And um, I've mentally prepared myself that, you know, we could possibly lose everything we have. Um, and I mean, I'm not gonna lie, that uh, that's scary. And, you know, I don't wanna lose everything I have. You know, I know that uh, when God closes one door, he opens another. You know, there's, there's a time you have to decide what you're going to stand up for and fight for. And, you know, where is your line? Where are you going to be quiet for everything? When you're involved in a wedding, you're actually asking this person to take hours and hours, days and days of their lives and use their artistic talents to promote messages that are contrary to their core beliefs. They don't have a right to compel each and every photographer in the state of New Mexico to provide them with the artistic skills of photography. Um, they have the right to lead their life how they choose to. Um, they have the right to go to a church that will provide them with a service. If the church wants to provide them with that service, they have the right to hire a photographer who will take pictures for them if the photographer wants to take pictures for them. But there's no natural right to compel other people into celebrating your wedding. I don't think the founders could have ever conceived the time when someone was told, you can't practice your trade. You can't engage in business if somehow the government um, doesn't like what you think and doesn't accept your particular faith point of view. This concept of non-discrimination has now been exported to lots of other debates. And a lot of our social engineering is being done in the name of non-discrimination. And anybody who dares oppose that is now a supporter of discrimination. You're not hearing the voices of, of people that say, listen, I have no bigotry, but I just feel uncomfortable with this. Why can't I feel uncomfortable? Why are you forcing me to do this, the, go the government is saying, no, we're going to force you to do it because um, as far as we're concerned, it's no different than racial bigotry. You know, the, the, the American Civil Rights Movement, largely in the African-American cause, was, was only seeking constitutional rights. It was only seeking a, the justified rights that ought to be extended to all citizens. There is this taking someone's personal lifestyle choice 
and their willingness to expose to the public their choices to put it equal with an immutable, unchangeable aspect of our lives, such as the color of our skin. The Bible was the standard for the civil rights movement of the 20th century, the Holy Bible. The most visible leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., my uncle, was a Christian minister. We cannot raise as a standard for civil rights. Well, I want to do this, so this is my civil right. There has to be a standard. There has to be a guideline. And it is actually a, a, does a great disservice to the courageous pioneers who fought for civil rights in the 1960s and 70s based out of, let us not forget, the texts and traditions of the Bible. So it's actually a religious impulse that caused civil rights. I marched, I went to jail. In our training, we had to promise to read our Bible every day, to pray to God, to honor Jesus, to love each other. Those were prayers that we prayed before we marched. And I believe that people have forgotten those standards. You know, the founders sought to protect the free exercise of religion. And that meant much more than just freedom to worship. The blessings that we enjoy today are to have the freedom of religion in our daily lives. We see some people trying to constrict that to the freedom of worship. What they're trying to do is constrain the space for religion to the four walls of a church on a Sunday morning and to say, you're free to do whatever you want there, but not to do it you know, in your business or at your school or wherever the, the case may be. The idea of freedom of religion is freedom for religious expression. What they don't understand is that worship is so much more than what we do on Sunday mornings, that indeed my entire life is to be an act of worship, that my vocation and my relationships with others are a form of worship. You see the, the movement from uh, freedom of religion to freedom of worship. What's happening now is that intentionally or unintentionally, they're offering us, the federal government's offering us freedom of worship, but restricting freedom of religion. Freedom of worship means you're allowed to go to church on Sunday morning and between 11 and 12, inside that building, you can do whatever you want to. It's a purely secular view of America. It's one that will tolerate religious freedom to the extent that you are willing, as a religious adherent, to stay within the four corners of your house or the four corners of your church and pray and worship God. But don't bring it out into the public square. Don't bring it into your business or into the schools or any of that because that will be polarizing, that will be divisive. Faith cannot be confined to what you do for an hour once a week. That is not religion um, and it's not worship. Separation of church and state isn't found in the Constitution. Now that phrase is in the Constitution, the former Constitution of the Soviet Union, but it's not found anywhere in any of our official documents. The way it's being perverted today, particularly by people who aren't pro-religious freedom at all, is they will use it to say, uh, well, uh, wherever government is, you can't have religion there. And of course, the government is now everywhere. And so this is simply a way to push religious freedom to the corners of society. It's almost like a mantra uh, that everyone who doesn't like a person of faith and, them, uh, and that person standing up for those moral values, they'll throw out the mantra, separation of church and state. You know, go back into your church walls and leave us alone out here in public life. The wall of separation was talking about between the institutions of the church and the institution of the state. We don't want the church leading the government as an institution. We don't want the government leading the church as an institution. Well, the, the phrase is a, a phrase that Jefferson wrote in a letter in 1802 to the Danbury Baptist Association. They were a group of churches, Baptist churches in Connecticut. Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptists, which does mention a wall of separation between church and state, is often confused with the actual Constitution itself. The Danbury Baptists wrote President Jefferson, concerned about the state of Connecticut, imposing their religious beliefs on the, on the Baptists. When Thomas Jefferson 
wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association. We have to realize that they were coming to him because they saw him as a champion of religious liberty and freedom. What the point for Jefferson was there is that the government has no business telling people what their statement of faith ought to look like. What he was talking about, and very clearly, read the letter, he was talking about a wall of separation so the state could not tell people of faith how to live their lives. And today, we've kind of turned the whole thing around. It's kind of like church, Christian people, you can't have anything to do with public life. It was the Supreme Courts in 1947 that kind of found that phrase that had not really been popular at all. The Everson Supreme Court case in 1947 took language from Jefferson's private letter to the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802 and made it law. They extracted it from Jefferson's letter, then they misapplied it, and then we've built a whole concept out of it today. And of course, the one who used those words were Hugo Black, who wanted to keep the Catholic school in New Jersey from receiving public funds. Hugo Black was a, was a former member of the KKK. Most people don't know that, but he was a former member of the KKK. He was virulently anti-Catholic, and, and Hugo Black did not want to support Catholic education, didn't want to support the Catholic Church. And so he was trying to find something, reach back and find something as a, as a way to stop federal support for Catholic education. And it was this hatred of Catholics that prompted this use of the phrase, a separation of church and state. Like a lot of Supreme Court decisions, they're watershed moments, but we don't realize they are at the time. The phrase separation of church and state became law in 1947. It had never been before. And that changed everything. We need to see more respect for religious liberty in our education system today. Political correctness is running rampant over our educational institutions. The Judeo-Christian heritage that has informed American history is one that welcomes rational discourse and that presumes that we would have reasonable dialogue in the public square, and that should include public schools. They say that when you enter the door of a public school, you must park your faith outside. What a radically bizarre notion. Sadly, we've had numerous incidents over the decades that have left a kind of climate of intimidation, that this is not welcome, that your perspectives on ultimate realities are not something that should be engaged in the sphere of education. That's really a very limiting and stultified idea of what uh, academics and education would be about. Any of this information about science or history or literature, these involve inevitably questions about first things about the origin and destiny and purpose and meaning of life. And to suggest in a classroom that those kinds of ideas are not welcome or, or can't be engaged is antithetical to the educational enterprise. They wanted to inspire the team. You had a bunch of girls, you know, 14, 15, 16 year old girls that were tired of kill or mash the other team on signs. They thought, you know, what can we do that's encouraging? When they begin to talk about inspiring and being inspirational or being an encouragement, and they talked to a school official, and uh, that school official told them, you know, as long as an adult's not involved, well, it's okay. The football team got behind it. They were 100% they were for it, and uh, it was neat to see those kids bond like that. It was confusion at first as to, you know, who had a problem with it. We couldn't imagine who it was. And then all of a sudden, a letter comes from across the country from a group from Madison, Wisconsin, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, threatening the school if they don't stop the kids from, you know, mentioning God on their signs. So we actually had to go into court to defend their the most basic right to free speech and free exercise of religion. They put all these girls through hearings. They put them through depositions from hostile attorneys. Uh, but they stood their ground the whole way. It does not communicate 
anything on the part of the school when a student freely expresses their religious viewpoint. And this is what we need to become more comfortable with, is the idea that students should be able to, when it's completely under their volition, express aspects of their faith, aspects of their belief. These are their signs, paid for by their money. Uh, the schools had nothing to do with their signs. Uh, they didn't decide what goes on them. They don't pay for the paint. The girls did, and, and their parents. You know, in America, that's called free speech. Uh, it inspired the team and um, the town. Everybody loved it. Everybody was encouraged. These girls had done a great thing. You know, Koontz has 2,100 citizens in, in the city. Their Facebook page had 60,000 Facebook fans last I saw. It was overwhelming, and it wasn't just the Koontz community. But we had folks from all over Southeast Texas in support of the girls, and, and my favorite one was a World War II veteran that had a sign that said, I fought in World War II for the rights for these girls to do what they're doing, and I support them. What a ridiculous thing to say is that somehow a person who might be exposed to a point of view other than his own is somehow going to be irreparably harmed. The freedom from religion perspective gets this idea wrong. They are trying to suggest that there should be a sanitized corridor where no religious viewpoint can be expressed at the peril that someone somewhere might be offended by it. We don't have the right not to be offended. We have the right to express our religious viewpoints. The First Amendment doesn't say that you get to speak unless you offend someone. It's not the way it works. Religion on our college campuses is live and well unless your religion happens to be Christianity. I did my undergrad at Michigan State University and have been in the teaching profession now for close to two decades. I decided along the way that I was interested in working with students on a different level. I was in practicum, had just started, and that's really when everything changed. I read the file of the new client that I had been given. I noticed that my client was a homosexual and was dealing with identity issues. While I have no problems whatsoever counseling someone that identifies as homosexual, I would not, based on my Christian beliefs, be able to affirmatively counsel someone that was looking for help with their same-sex relationship. And so what I decided to do was call my advisor. And when I called her, I said, what I'd like to know from you is should I meet with the client and establish rapport and only refer if it becomes necessary. The ethics code for the American Counseling Association, which is the code that governed uh, the program that Julia was in, uh, has a broad allowance for referrals that says anytime you find that you're unable to be of professional assistance, you can refer a client. She said, have the client reassigned. And I thought that that was the end of it. I was told um, by my advisor that I had discriminated against homosexuals. They gave me three options. They said that I could take part in a remediation program that would show me the error of my thinking. They said I could remove myself from the program. Now mind you, I'm almost finished with the program. Or I could request a formal review. Well, I chose the latter. I received a certified letter in the mail telling me that it had been decided that I should be expelled from the program. And so I was. As Julia Ward found out, the choice was between her degree or her religion. As others are finding out, it's a choice between their professions uh, and their religious beliefs. And so, you know, for the other side, it's not a live and let live. It's not a tolerance applies equally to everyone. It's you either get on board with their message, their orthodoxy when it comes to these issues, or you give up things that are critical to you, important to you, including your faith. Julia Ward knows tolerance is not something that applies to everyone. Um, it applies to people who are willing 
to comply with the governing orthodoxy on a university campus. And if you're not willing to comply, all that stuff about tolerance doesn't matter. I'm a Christian, you know, at home, in the workplace, at school. And to say that I'm a Christian, that doesn't mean that I'm out trying to proselytize everyone. What that means is that the same standard that God has for me at home, He has for me at work, He has for me at school. One of the most radical ways in which religion is being just attacked in a frontal way is through the military. Our chaplaincy in America um, has its founding even before our nation was founded. It was George Washington saying, you know what, to Congress, I need you to pay for these chaplains. He knew if he was going to put together an army that could win, he needed an army that had the full assistance of what he called providence. Chaplains have served in every war, in every conflict, wherever our military forces have gone. And for those who haven't served, they don't understand the key role that chaplains play in our nation's military. The next thing we know, we're on ship uh, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Just in a very short time, we were already in France. We were thrown right into battle right away in the Battle of the Bulge. And, and every so often, word would come to us that there'd be a chaplain behind the line two miles back or whatever, anybody that wants to go back for church service, leave in the morning at four o'clock or whatever, guess what? I always went back. I always crawled out of that hole and go back because I felt so secure with God on my side. This is a unique calling to serve as a military chaplain. What I always say about my role as a chaplain is that I am there to keep the mission going. And my job is just to make sure that the, the most important part of the mission, which is our men and women who serve, are ready mentally to do the job that they're called to do. That's what chaplains do. You get into it to serve soldiers and their families, to bring soldiers to God and God to soldiers. That also meant that it was my responsibility to go with those officers who notified the next of kin. Toughest job a chaplain can do. We're seeing a great imposition on the chaplain's corps. The military chaplaincies are, are afraid for their jobs, afraid for their positions. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen a military develop over the past few years where chaplains are not allowed to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. In the instance of Catholic chaplains, uh, they were actually told to ignore a posting that they were required to read from the archbishop because they were afraid it might inflame uh, the, the troops. Uh, this is truly outrageous behavior. The, the part that concerns me the most in this uh, environment is that chaplains are being pushed more into to a secular role of a mental health provider. And that's not what we do. When you start muzzling the chaplains, uh, then you're really undercutting not only the morale of the armed forces, you're undercutting the military readiness. There seems to be the minority voices winning out and saying, let's keep uh, you know, Bibles off the desk. But to just simply blanket it off and say, you know, anything I say or a Bible sitting on my desk or a Torah sitting on my desk or a Koran sitting on my desk is overt proselytizing is just a little laughable. We want our chaplains to be able to preach the gospel and continue to nurture the living, comfort the wounded, and honor the fallen. What's happening are people are, are having to make a choice uh, between their careers and their religion. And, and that should never happen. Now, there's, this country was built on religious freedom. There is no reason why anyone in the United States, and especially anyone that serves in the military, to have to abandon their religious beliefs in favor of their career. That's completely wrong, it's unconstitutional, it's illegal, and it needs to be stopped. I studied Bonhoeffer in college, 
And one of the most important books I ever read was the book, The Cost of Discipleship, that Bonhoeffer wrote. The reason religious liberty is so important is that it's one of those things that's sort of not reversible if you get it wrong. So this is one of those things. The portcullis is coming down. It's not as though we can get to this when we get to it. And I think that um, th that's exactly the urgency in the Bonhoeffer story. He knows that it's possible to wake up the German church, and he does everything he can, but they don't wake up. Bonhoeffer saw, I think around 35, 36, uh, and then certainly in 37, that they had lost. The church was unwilling to take a stand, and they had all kinds of reasons. Some of them are good reasons, but they weren't good enough. Um, and at some point, the battle was over. In Germany in the 30s, you had the different sides, different parts of the church, you know, unwilling to link arms in a sense. And in retrospect, you think, oh my goodness, imagine not linking arms against Adolf Hitler. Uh, here you have such a clear enemy of the church. Now, many of them were ignorant. They did not understand what an enemy he was of the church. But Bonhoeffer was trying to wake them up and say that, listen, we are all united in this. We all need to link arms and fight as one and hold this line where Germany and the German church will die. The good news is that the American church is slightly more attuned to the rumbling herd in the distance uh, than the German church was in the 30s. The bad news is only slightly, right? Here's a picture of religious liberty under siege. And Bonhoeffer, for whatever reason, sort of like a, like a prophet, was the only one to really see this with clarity. Bonhoeffer faced it not in the abstract, but in, in the concrete world of reality, where if he'd simply renounced his faith, or just softened it, just went along, he could have spared his life. But not only did he fail to go along, but he openly resisted and rebuked, and it cost him his life. And, you know, the, the parallel today is simply that you have a government, a state, which is getting larger and larger and more and more powerful and is beginning to push against the church. There's a window of opportunity where we can fight. If we don't wake up and fight before then, we won't be able to fight. That's just what happened in Germany. And that's the urgency we have in America now. And people think that that's incendiary or I'm being hyperbolic. I'm sorry. I wish, I wish, I wish I were. I, I'm not. This is not about us needing to move out of our comfort zone. This is about our comfort zone no longer existing. Basically, there will be a cost that will have to be paid by both Christians and churches for what they believe. We are right at the precipice of that time when I believe churches are gonna start experiencing persecution for speaking the truth. You strip away really all the influence of the Christian faith on America, it will be a Western European country. We're headed to a place of greater conflict. We are a very short span of time away from full bore persecution in ways we never even imagined. Once things start spiraling, it will go quickly. Nobody would have thought America could have changed this much in the last five years. No one could have predicted this. It is happening, it will continue to happen, it will heighten, there will be a price to pay. It's only gonna get more front and center. And you don't have to be a prophet to realize that. If you'll just look at what Jesus said, you know, it's not going to get easier, period. And so the church is gonna have to navigate some very, very difficult waters here in America because we're not used to having our religious freedoms infringed upon. And how we respond to that in this critical time, it's radically important. The reason that we have the kind of cultural pushback that we do today on people of faith is that the people of faith have treated it as if it was really unimportant, as if it were truly disposable. There are a lot of people who talk about religious liberty, but they never get to the gospel. They get to the founders but they don't get to the gospel. There, there really is a need for the church to repent. I think the church has to come get on their knees before God. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. The gateway to turn around is a door called repentance. 
There has to be weeping and wailing before God to God to have mercy upon us, that His grace and mercy will fall upon us. That's going to be the price of us continuing in a land of blessing, a land of provision, and all the great things that America has been. Return to the Lord, return humbly to God, and we're blessed. If we don't, we're not. I would say the body of Christ is very divided today in terms of its knowledge. There's basically one part of the body that is up to date, following the internet, following the cases, very alert, very aware. Then there's another part that is, to be kind, absolutely clueless. And I believe the result of this really inattentiveness to what's happening in our culture is causing Christians to see their rights to religious freedom erode very quickly. We are living in a time when more resources are at the tip of our fingers than ever before. There is no excuse to be uninformed. You know, Jefferson said, um, a free people must be an educated people, right? People need to learn about their rights, learn where their rights come from, learn that religious freedom is not granted by government and therefore can't be taken away by government. We need to know how to apply the Founders' ideas to these 21st century challenges. That will ensure a safe future for religious liberty. But if we do not, if we do not take this challenge seriously, then we will continue to see the erosion of religious liberty. And that will be a travesty for the history of the United States. What's gonna happen in the next three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years as a nation is really up to whether or not we engage whether or not we stand, or whether we sit back and let those who have an agenda have their way. We all have a responsibility to find out what's going on in America and engage. We're called to be the very best of good citizens. And that means being out there and working and acting in this political sphere. Look, the word politics means to govern, control, or to influence. When you say a Christian shouldn't get involved in politics, what you're saying is Christians shouldn't be trying to influence the culture in which they live. How can any Christian say that with a straight face? I don't see anywhere in the scripture where it says go into all the world except politics. I think we're to go straight on into that world carrying the contagious message of Jesus Christ. The single most influential factor in the direction of the nation is the direction of our churches. And what determines the direction our churches take are what our pastors teach and preach. The church really needs to wake up, and if the pastors, priests, and ministers don't wake up, the church can't wake up. The job is to teach what is true about the sanctity of human life at all stages and conditions, or the dignity of marriage as the conjugal union of husband and wife, or the importance of religious freedom and the rights of conscience, to teach them in season and out of season, to teach the truth when it makes you popular or when in the cultural circumstances it makes you unpopular. Most pastors, ministers, priests in America, they've lived in a time where they haven't had to do this, and I think they need to discern the times and understand that they have to step up. Uh, otherwise, it, it will be nothing less than cowardice. I mean, you look at the, the pastors in Germany who didn't speak out, what do we think of them now? A small percentage of pastors get that, they see what's coming, they're willing to stand up, they're understanding it's time to stop talking about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and start being willing to be him. You're gonna have to make a decision, choose you this day who you will serve. If it's God, serve God. If it's Baal or the kingdoms, religions, or ideas of this world, then serve him. You're gonna have to make a choice. You're gonna have to stand courageously, and you're gonna have to speak the truth in love under the unction and power of the Spirit of God. The most important thing that pastors could be saying right now as it pertains to religious freedom is to challenge their congregants, to challenge the followers of Jesus Christ to live their faith uncompromisingly, unapologetically, in the workplace, uh, in the schools, to live out their faith with the appropriate demeanor of, of respect and humility, but boldly. 
no matter how much we disagree with them, every person that exists was created Imago Dei, in the image and likeness of God. And because they are in the image of God, we must treat them with dignity and respect at all times. That's the way we are called as members of the body of Christ to fight. Vigorously, hard, with excellence, but with respect for those we oppose. As off track as our American government has gone, we do have moments when we get to speak what we believe. And if we don't take those moments, we aren't exercising the power that we have to do good. Enter the public square boldly, confidently, unafraid, and stand up for the most important principles. We have been blessed with so many freedoms, so many liberties. And so when we, when we look at all the blessings we have in America, it's only natural that we have to remember not to take them for granted and that we have to make a difference and we have to make sure that we're the generation that preserves these freedoms and liberties for future generations. There's a common sense to Americans. Uh, it tends to be live and let live. And I'm not so confident in Washington, but I am confident in the American people, in the common sense of the American people. And I think in the long term, that common sense will govern. And uh, most of this is about pushing back the federal government and pushing back government in general and saying you're, you're encroaching over the line of what ought to be a citizen's individual religious liberties. We need to be good stewards of all the good gifts that God has given us. And that includes the freedom and the heritage of liberty that we have. And so Christian citizenship entails guarding that for the good of our neighbor, for the good of society, uh, for the good of the next generation. I actually think we can turn the tide if we come to a point where we're more committed to God and to His truth than we are to the politically correct, ever-changing culture in which we live. You need to be registered and you need to be voting. So a healthy way to participate in this process is to simply vote. There's some good, decent people out there running for office and that are in office. We need to support them, those people that affirm our values, our Judeo-Christian values. I believe that if you were born in the United States of America, you have a responsibility and an obligation to not only vote, but to be well informed. To not only be well informed, but to educate those in your community and in your sphere of influence. Christians vote. We, we, we have to vote. I mean, we're, it's a part of our Christian citizenship. It's a part of being salt and light. So if you're a Christian, you vote. Elections have consequences. National elections determine who's going to be in the Supreme Court and sit on federal benches. Local school elections determine who's going to make decisions regarding our schools. It is important we get involved in the political process and choose godly leaders. Winning elections, electing people who are uh, conscious of uh, the vital importance of religious liberty, and will join with uh, like-minded people, these are all part of the, of the mix. God says that, you know, that, that we are to be careful who we choose to govern. Choose from among yourselves those that are wise and fear God, that have a biblical worldview, because those who govern us obviously have a great impact on our ability to fulfill our God-given duties. Now, we need to be careful of the sources we go to and, and have trusted sources that uh, come from organizations that have a, a clear mission to operate from a biblical worldview and help you understand those issues, but they'll give you the guides on where the candidates stand. I think one of the most effective ways that churches can empower and equip their people in being better citizens is to provide them voter guides. We as Christians in churches need to get engaged and get behind these individuals and support them with our money, with our time, with our talents, and help get them elected. Too many Christians have taken um, our religious liberty for granted for too many years. And I think we're all guilty of that. So it's time that people learn the value of religious liberty, what a precious gift it is. And if we don't learn that lesson, we're gonna lose it. Duty is ours, results belong to God. And I think that's how we have to approach this. Duty to stand for truth and speak that truth in love, that's our duty. The outcome, 
As much as we hope that this country will change, and it may, and I hope it does, and I pray that it does, but if it doesn't, the results ultimately belong to God. Hello, I'm Tim Wildman, president of the American Family Association, and I want to thank you for watching A Time to Speak. I think we've proven here in this video that there is a real threat to religious freedoms in this country. You may be asking, what can I do? What can one person do? Well, you can visit our website, atimetospeak.com, where you'll find sermon outlines, voter guides, and much more information, including how to order more copies of this DVD for your friends and your family. Again, continue to pray for America, continue to vote, encourage your friends and family to get involved as well, lest we lose our religious freedoms. Thank you for watching. God bless you.